Hello, my name is Mae Hanslick, and I'm a part of the team at the National Complete Streets Coalition. Welcome to our webinar series, Complete Streets 301, Putting People First. On this webinar series, you can join us and our special guests each month for a new topic related to creating streets and places that put people first. We're glad you could join us for today's webinar on prioritizing pedestrians. I'd now like to introduce and turn it over to Emiko Atherton. Emiko Atherton is the Vice President for Thriving Communities and Director of the National Complete Streets Coalition, a program of Smart Growth America. As Vice President of Thriving Communities, Emiko oversees SGA's public health community-driven engagement, placemaking, and rural communities work. In her role as the Director of the Coalition, Emiko oversees the program's overall strategy, federal advocacy, communications, research, and technical assistance programs. She has used her expertise in transportation policy, public health, land use, economic development, and legislation to consult with communities across the United States on how to create better transportation networks. Emiko is an international voice on complete streets and has spoken to audiences across the country about the value of this approach. Emiko, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, May, and welcome, everyone, and a really special welcome today uh, for taking the time to join us during what we all recognize are really challenging times. Um, you know, we at the coalition uh, ourselves are working at home right now and have been for a few weeks, um, and have really been able to watch all of you um, stand up and support your communities, and so we're really thankful and grateful that you were able to spend this next hour with us and our friends as we present about how to prioritize pedestrians. Uh, I will say now more than ever, you know, we really see uh, the need for our walkable, livable, rollable, bikeable streets. Um, you know, as a plug to something else we're doing at the coalition, we want to hear your stories um, and ways that your cities are handling um, COVID-19 from a transportation and public space point of view. We want to disseminate that information and share and hear what we're learning uh, with all of you. But today we're going to focus on the webinar we actually had planned prior to all of this, um, and it's one I've been looking forward to for a really learned, long time, and it's to hear about how Minneapolis has worked to prioritize pedestrians and advance multimodal transportation through advocacy, policy, and safer street design. Today we'll be hearing from a number of stakeholders who have all played a role in Minneapolis's ability to move from what we call policy to practice when it comes to prioritizing pedestrians. But before we do that, I just want to go over a couple of housekeeping notes. We are recording this webinar and a copy of the presentation as well as the webinar will be available on our blog after the webinar. Uh, I know we often get questions and we'll make sure that we share that with all of you. Uh, if you have questions for the speakers throughout the presentation, please share them with us in the chat box located in the lower left-hand corner of your webinar screen, and we'll try to answer as many of those as possible at the end of the presentation. We also try to answer as many questions as possible in the recap blog, so even if we don't get to your question today, we'll try to get to it in the blog. Uh, I also wanted to note that the webinar systems are experiencing extreme, uh, an extra strain right now. All of our speakers are calling from their home phones, so please bear with us as any, uh, if we experience any technology hiccups. Um, also, let us know in the chat box if you're having tech problems and we'll be able to troubleshoot with you. So let's talk about why we're doing this and why implementation matters. Uh, as I mentioned, the focus of the webinar is on the importance of moving from policy to practice. And at the coalition, we always keep this concept in the front uh, of our minds and it guides our work. Uh, we know that the strongest transportation policies stipulate strong implementation guidelines and requirements. Without those requirements, we know that a policy can fall short. I often say that they, they become press release policies that collect dust on shelves. And I know as someone that has worked on those, it's very easy to happen. It's one of the main reasons why we updated our Complete Streets Policy Framework at the end of 2017 to require more when it comes to Complete Streets implementation and equity. A city's ability to move from policy to practice is key when, when it comes to the safety of our streets. 
So we're first excited to hear more about how this has worked out in the city of Minneapolis. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speakers, Janice Park and Isaac Shapiro from Remix. Uh, Janice is a senior transportation manager at Remix who works with transit agencies across the United States to develop technology solutions that dramatically improve the planning process while enabling greater exploration and public engagement. Janice is passionate about the future of cities and the intersection of technology and planning to promote sustainable growth. Previously, Janice conducted economic research and wrote for the Urban Institute in Washington, D.C., studied transit-oriented development, parking, and transit for UC Berkeley, served as an analyst for San Francisco's Metropolitan Transportation Authority, and worked with a variety of public agencies as a consultant with Cambridge Systematics. She has a bachelor's in economics from Pomona College and holds two master's degrees in city planning and transportation engineering from uh, UC Berkeley. Isaac is an enterprise customer, service, customer success manager at Remix who works with transit agencies across the country from the Northeast to the Pacific Northwest. Isaac partners with his customers for training and support to improve their transit systems. Prior to joining Remix, Isaac worked as a transportation and planning consultant and a federal health care policy analyst. He is passionate about helping local governments build more livable cities that support their communities. He holds a bachelor's degree in history from Carleton College. Great. And so uh, from that, Janice and Isaac. Thank you, Emiko. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, as you just heard, my name is Isaac Shapiro, and I'm a customer success manager at Remix. And we're co-hosting this webinar with SGA. So we wanted to provide a brief introduction of who Remix is and how we work with cities for those who aren't familiar. So Remix is a technology company that started now with five and a half years ago by uh, four founders who met at Code for America. So Code for America is a nonprofit fellowship focused on developing technology solutions for cities all over the country. Here's a, here's a picture of our four co-founders looking uh, uh, five and a half years younger. <laughs> um, and while meeting with cities across the country, our co-founders got a firsthand view of uh, the transportation planning process. So illustrated here by David Moss, who's the former director of service planning at the New York MTA. We saw transit planners kind of regardless of agency size or location, relying on a combination of pen, paper, Excel, and other softwares to do their jobs. And as David is showing us here, kind of his, his workflow, you'd sketch out a route alternative on a piece of paper. Then if you wanted to bring any cost analysis into that, you turn to Excel. And then if you want to incorporate any sort of demographic analysis on top of that to understand who has access to kind of your transportation network, you'd need to incorporate yet another tool and maybe query some census data. And one of the, the more frustrating aspects of all this is anytime your plan changed slightly, um, you'd have to start all the way from the beginning and go back and kind of draw out the route again, bring in the Excel data again, bring in the census demographic data again. And so essentially it was kind of a, a very scattered process. And seeing how cumbersome this process uh, was, our co-founders came together and they built a platform basically to bring all aspects of transit planning into one place. So you wouldn't have to turn to your sketch pad and then your computer and then uh, your GIS analyst computer. You could just all do it all in, a, all in one space. So from our roots in transportation planning, um, we've expanded into uh, street design and data analysis for city planners. And as you can see by this, this little map here, we now work with over 325 cities around the world. Um, I think it's on four continents and over a, a dozen countries. And from those, uh, those four people uh, you saw sitting in a room earlier, we now have over 70 people on staff um, with roughly 50% of those employees coming from the technology industry and the other half, the other 50%, like Janice and myself, uh, coming from the urban planning world. So a little background on kind of where, where how Remix got its start, um, kind of 
give a little more context on, on how we fit into the, the picture that we're going to be discussing today, I'm going to turn it over to uh, my colleague, Janice. Thanks, Isaac. So that's a very brief history of Remix as a company culture. I'm going to just talk really briefly about our current charge. So right now, our goal as a technology company is to continue serving our city partners primarily in three ways. First is to help cities make informed decisions. So we think nimble data analysis is the key here. So the nimbleness allows you to identify whether your plans are a go or a no-go quickly. Um, it also helps you identify trade-offs between multiple ideas very rapidly. So here's a snapshot of Remix's Data Explorer platform. You can see that you can draw this custom geographic boundary. That's what you're seeing, this blue square. And then get a snapshot of what's going on, on the, in, in the boundary on the left-hand corner here. Um, and we're seeing transit agencies use this to draw micro transit zones, and we're seeing city DOTs use this to quickly understand existing conditions in project areas. The second way that we try to help cities is basically help them explore design options rapidly. So both Remix Street Design Platform and the Transit Planning Platform is designed for very rapid iteration, so that collaboration in between departments is seamless. Um, this is just a quick quote from Carlos from Miami-Dade County. So very quick story here, Miami-Dade um, Miami County, their Department of Transportation had this actual physical division between the planners and the transportation engineers. They sat in different buildings, and they used to communicate their ideas for street changes verbally via email, which produced probably unnecessary inertia for starting critical projects. Um, that's just one example, and we'll hear from Trey from Minneapolis, a, a richer and more nuanced story. So the third way that we try to help cities is essentially to help them effectively collaborate with stakeholders and members of the community. So we're always trying to continue on working on ways that cities and transit agencies can expand their reach, both in person or virtually. And during this time of this global pandemic, I think all of us are realizing how important it is to collaborate um, with community members um, and also with each other, how, how important that is. And I think after this global pandemic subsides, that virtual connection is still going to remain very important. So thank you very much for your time. If you're interested in learning more about Remix, here are some resources for you. And then Isaac and I are available for any questions. Great, thank you so much for that. Uh, and again, just as a reminder, please go ahead and type your questions in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Trey Joyner from the City of Minneapolis. Troy is an Associate Transportation Planner with the City of Man Minneapolis who works within the Transportation Planning and Programming Division. Before working for the city, he provided transportation planning guidance and te technical expertise to approximately 20 counties in East Tennessee. Starting in 2018 with the city of Minneapolis, he now works on a variety of planning activities related to coordinating development impacts to the right-of-way, capital improvement program planning, and bikeway design and operations. He's a Georgia native, but is slowly getting accustomed to northern lifestyles. He holds a bachelor's degree in urban and regional planning from the University of West Georgia. Thanks so much, Trey. Thanks, Emika. So, as Emika mentioned, I'll be talking about the President's Park School Boulevard and how it's in Minneapolis uh, took policy to practice. So, briefly, I'll go over the. I'll start with defining the area. I'll talk about the project context, go over some design considerations and how we use Remix, and then briefly close on some proposed upgrades. So, define the area. Uh, shown here, the project. Fact sheet, but I'll briefly summarize it by saying the main goal of the project was to fill a gap in the bicycle network by building an all ages, all abilities bikeway to create an enhanced pedestrian environment and organize the intersection to encourage more predictable movement. The project's width was about uh, 0.13 miles, so about 800 feet. And I have to apologize for my slides. I thought my animations were going to work, but uh, technical difficulties. 
But as shown here are Minneapolis three iterations, or current two iterations of our bicycle master plan. The image to the left was our old bicycle master plan from 2011, where it called for a flyover bicycle uh, uh, treatment at the intersection uh, shown in the red circle. In 2015, we updated our bicycle master plan, and a more practical solution was identified that was at grade. So in addition to the planned bikeway upgrades, uh, the present bicycle boulevard fit into the fabric of larger transformative changes being delivered by the county during the same time. As you can see, the county was doing a resourcing of, of about a mile. Uh, it included a safety conversion or a four to three lane conversion of a existing four lane undivided road. Also in 2019, 2020, the uh, county was uh, implementing ADA ramp upgrades. Um, all planned during the same time frame as the President's Bicycle Boulevard uh, project. So, planned improvements into the context of diverse mixed-use neighborhoods. The President's Bicycle Boulevard connects commercial and residential corridors where freight, bike, pedestrian, and emergency services come to conflict with one another. So it was important that future upgrades work for a multitude of users, but most importantly, those users who are experiencing the most barriers to travel. Project context. So I'll pause for a little bit so you can guys see you can see the full breadth of uh, the local and national best practices that Minneapolis used to guide our project design. I mean, uh, our, so our comprehensive plan in our Minneapolis 2040 comprehensive plan seeks to densify Minneapolis and reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and reduce barriers to access and quality housing, jobs, transportation, and essential services. Our adopted Vision Zero Action Plan in 2020 commits the city to the elimination of all severe and fatal injuries on Minneapolis streets by 2027. And our draft transportation action plan, our 10-year transportation plan, will establish a series of goals how, for how we design our mobile network in Minneapolis, reinforcing the city's adopted complete streets policy. So this is an image uh, shown, the image shown here is our transportation action plan draft pedestrian priority network and our all ages, all abilities bikeway network and how they overlap in the project area. The tab identifies streets on these networks as needs to be improved within the next 10 years or more to better reflect our complete streets policy. So both of these networks overlap with the present bicycle boulevard project and the county's resurfacing project. So this graphic shows the council approved layout, which was approved earlier this year which would serve as the basis for further uh, detailed engineering. So here's where I'll dive more into the nitty-gritty of the project details. I'll briefly describe the problem and present the design solutions we ultimately landed upon. Um, so, so this uh, the image in the back. I apologize for the graphics. The image in the back uh, shows the existing conditions of the present bicycle boulevard. And the image shows existing conditions of the most, most difficult crossing. The overhead flashing beacon shown in the image was installed in 2014. And funny enough, things got worse after it was installed. From 2000 to 2014, there are several recorded crashes. None of those were with pedestrians or, or cyclists, probably because the context of the roadway didn't, uh, wasn't conducive to that type of travel. So when the overhead flashing beacon was installed um, after that, so from 2015 to 2019, 13 crashes were recorded. Uh, this, is large, this is large in part due to land use change at the intersection, um, the new uh, accessibility that the flashing beacon, flashing beacon brought, um, and increased uh, numbers in bicycle and pedestrian traffic in, this, traffic in this portion of the city. So in 2019, of those 13 crashes... Hey, Trey. Uh, so, Sorry to yep. interrupt. Uh, this is May. I was wondering if it would be possible for you to move a little bit closer to the microphone. Some of the participants yep. are having a little bit of difficulty hearing you. Sorry sorry for the interruption. Oh, yeah. No, you're okay. You're okay. Um, so, yeah, I'll go back a little bit. Uh, so, from 2015 to 2019, uh, 13 recorded crashes. Well, there are 13 recorded crashes. Of those 13 recorded crashes, uh, seven of those were in 2019. And of those seven, two of them were with a pedestrian, and one was with, one was with a, a bicycle. So needless to say that this intersection um, flagged as a potential location for the installation of a fully signalized intersection, and I'll dip into that in the next slide. So 
as I mentioned, as I mentioned in the beginning, the goals of the project were to create an enhanced pedestrian environment, and that's shown here. In addition to a county four to four to three lane conversion, the project will build a ten foot curb extension with improved bicycle and pedestrian space at a new signalized intersection. Um, the good time to highlight that remix is essential when brainstorming and vetting design treatment with, uh, internal and, with internal and external partners, especially since I'm no Vincent Van Gogh and I'm not able to design pretty streets. So I also want to call your attention to call your attention to the treatments at the intersection with Fifth Avenue Southeast, um, and the ability of the project to accommodate a shared bike and pet space that allows for a two-phase bicycle maneuver at a non-typical intersection. I say non-typical because essentially this is a T intersection, but there's a driveway to the north that created almost a four-way intersection. So these are some quick images of uh, the 90% plan set for the intersection where we show some of the striping and some of the pavement removal at the at the intersection. As I mentioned, there's a 10-foot uh, curb extension on the northerly end to accommodate a five-foot hardscape boulevard with pedestrian scale lighting, a four-foot or eight-foot bidirectional bikeway, and a five-foot sidewalk. Sidewalks in the existing conditions were eight feet, um, but in in hopes of uh, an effort to make this intersection uh, and this project uh, more uh, uh, more accommodate different all all types of modes for pedestrians and bikes. We had to make trade-offs where um, we could, and that would involve um, shortening the or narrowing up the uh, sidewalk to fit in a, uh, a bicycle facility. So that was a that was a, a quite speedy, but I'll be available in the end to answer any detailed design questions or any engagement questions that um, any of you all ask. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Trey. And I know uh, many of you wrote in you're having uh, problems hearing, so we'll make sure in the recap webinar to cover anything you weren't able to hear. Uh, so stay tuned for that, so thanks so much. Um, last, I have the pleasure of introducing Ashwat Narayan, uh, who is the Executive Director of Our Streets Minneapolis. He has eight years of experience advocating for cleaner and more equitable transportation systems in the Midwest. Before Our Streets Minneapolis, he developed legislative, legal, and community organizing campaigns in Wisconsin to shift funding away from polluting highway expansion and into biking, walking, and transit. He was appointed by the Wisconsin Governor, Tony Ivers, the State Transportation Task Force that set statewide transportation priorities. In Minnesota, Ash serves on the Minnesota Department of Transportation's Sustainable Transportation Advisory Committee and represents Minneapolis on the Met Council's Transportation Advisory Board. He is also a transportation engineer and has a background in civil and transportation engineering. And this might be a good time also, Ash, to, um, just before you get speaking, to talk about really uh, how we paired these speakers. Uh, really, when I think about moving from policy, uh, complete streets policies, and we now have over 1,500 of them into practice, we're really seeing it takes an effort uh, from the public sector, the private sector, and our advocacy partners. So it takes really the public sector having the will to build projects, like the one Trey talked about, uh, with the tools often that some of our partners are developing, like Remix, but it also takes a really strong uh, advocacy community keeping the city uh, accountable and responsible for the policies that they set out. And so really one of the reasons uh, that we have the three of these is, is it takes uh, many different players um, to move those policies into practice for people. And so uh, that's why we decided, you know, in planning this, we wanted to make sure that we also had our strong advocacy community represented. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Ash. Thank you, Amiko. Um, and if folks are not able to hear me okay, please chat that out and I'll try to adjust speaking as we go along. So uh, a little background. Um, my name is Ash Narayanan. Uh, I'm the Executive Director at Our Streets Minneapolis. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, and our mission is to make biking, walking, and rolling in Minneapolis easy and comfortable for everyone. So 
um, a little outline of, of my presentation. I'll go through you know, why our mission is important, uh, the programs that we run, our vision for Minneapolis's transportation future, and how we can help get there. So uh, a little history about our streets Minneapolis. We started in 2009 as the Minneapolis Bicycle Coalition. Uh, in the photos, you can see uh, these were a group of volunteers who came together to start advocating for bike infrastructure in the city. At the time, that really was not a whole lot. Um, some folks I wanted to highlight who are part of the initial group are Lisa Bender on the left, uh, our former board president and now is the president of the Minneapolis City Council. In the second photo on the left is Lucretia Vita, another board president who is a Parks Board Commissioner now. And on the extreme right is Ethan Foley, the former executive director who is now the city's Vision Zero coordinator. Uh, I myself came on board almost exactly a year ago, before which I worked at the state level, uh, like Amico said, to advocate for spending more on public transit, walking and biking, and moving away from highway expansion programs. So uh, our, one of our first campaigns was the uh, our most successful campaign was called Bikeways for Everyone. Uh, this was a grassroots organizing effort to educate people about the various options that were available for bike infrastructure, uh, building community support around them, and then convincing elected officials and public works to invest in them. This campaign resulted in the creation of the city's bicycle master plan, and also, more importantly, I think, led to the creation of an engaged network of thousands of people who support our mission. Today, Minneapolis is known for having a pretty good network of bike infrastructure, and a lot of that is the result of this early organizing done by folks who are part of the Bike Coalition. Uh, in 2017, we rebranded from the Minneapolis Bicycle Coalition to become Our Streets Minneapolis uh, to affirm our commitment to people walking as well. One of our first campaigns as Our Streets Minneapolis was the Winter Sidewalk Maintenance Campaign. Uh, for Minneapolis that is covered in ice and snow for six months out of the year. Uh, it was, it's really important that people are able to walk freely in the wintertime. Uh, we again managed to get significant grassroots support uh, and convinced Minneapolis uh, elected officials and public works to implement a pilot project to understand how better they could clear ice and snow from sidewalks. Uh, and in 2020, we got an additional $300,000 committed to this effort in the mayor's adopted bu uh, budget. We also run the Open Streets program in partnership with the City of Minneapolis. This is our most popular and well-known program um, where major Minneapolis streets are opened up to folks biking, walking, and rolling, uh, and there are no cars allowed on the streets at the time. Uh, we also have programming on the streets, you know, food vendors, artists, musicians, uh, local businesses. I think it really is a celebration of all that Minneapolis has to offer, and you know, the, the venue is our, the streets of Minneapolis. So when we, we tie our mission to building a healthy region, uh, transportation investments have really an outsized impact in so many aspects of livability, you know, ranging from our economy to, uh, to getting folks to come live here, to making sure that we have stable and affordable housing. So we at Our Streets Minneapolis believe that every transportation decision has to be made carefully and should be calibrated towards building the community that we in Minneapolis aspire to be. So I briefly want to touch on some aspects of our current transportation system. As most of you know, today the transportation sector is the largest and fastest growing emitter of carbon emissions. We cannot transition to a clean energy economy without tackling transportation emissions. We also have huge racial disparities as a tool, as a result of transportation decision making. Um, these are images from US EPA uh, environmental justice screening tool. Um, uh, the image here are maps of Minneapolis. On the left, we can see where major arterial roadways lie and how much traffic they carry. The redder those lines are, the more air pollution there is. On the, on the right is a map that's stratified by income. The deeper purple blocks are where there are higher percentages of folks with low income. You know, due to decades of discriminatory policy and planning, they also tend to be communities of color. And in Minneapolis, communities of color tend to breathe worse air from traffic pollution and also, as a result, suffer higher rates of asthma and, and cardiovascular disease. Um, we also have significant racial disparities in who is disproportionately affected by traffic crashes in Minneapolis. Native Americans are five times more likely to be killed than white Americans. Black Americans are three times more. 
um, likely and close to 500 people die each year in Minneapolis, in, in Minnesota from traffic crashes. And getting around without a car is not that easy. You know, the same trip uh, as highlighted here from north to south Minneapolis takes um, two bus changes and four times as long by transit compared to uh, driving. And here are a couple more photos of what Minneapolis winters are like, especially for those of us uh, among us who are uh, disabled. And on the right is, uh, you know, a bike lane that's covered with snow and ice for a large part of the year. Um, and we have entrenched ways of traffic engineering and planning that often maintain the status quo, you know, as in prioritizing traffic delay in our decision making and LOS, uh, continuing to add traffic lanes and maintaining really strict zoning regulations. So uh, that's today, but you know, we want to look towards the future. Um, from, it, from our streets, Minneapolis, uh, I just want to give a, a brief snapshot of what our vision is for 2030. Um, in 2030, uh, for starters, we'd like people to have the widest possible array of low and zero carbon transportation choices. Uh, so any trip could be made by walking, biking, transit, and uh, in the city of Minneapolis, and we hope to have the infrastructure to support that. We want to be able to, um, you know, people should be able to use a selection of shared electric vehicles like scooters uh, or any other new mode of transportation that comes online, or even make, have the decision to be able to use a personal electric vehicle. We should have achieved true vision zero, absolutely zero deaths on our streets from traffic crashes uh, through thoughtful measures that put safety first in transportation decision making. And then we would have reallocated our scarce right of way to really prioritize the throughput of people and not just vehicles. Uh, the true cost of driving would be made apparent, so consumers will need to get used to seeing and paying for the full cost of trips they make, including the environmental, societal, and economic costs. And if we're being really ambitious, we would have become, oh, it looks like audio is cutting in and out. I'm going to try and speak a little uh, slower and clearer. Um, feel free to keep chatting that out if you're still not able to hear me. Um, and so if we're being ambitious, you know, we would have begun work to repair some of the damage that our transportation decisions have inflicted on communities of color. Uh, we might be starting to think of ways to reconnect neighborhoods, you know, such as the Rondo neighborhood in St. Paul, where homes and businesses were destroyed to make way for inner city freeways. So um, how do we realize this vision? We uh, at Our Streets Minneapolis really believe that in order to achieve tangible change in the built environment, we first need to focus on changing the systems and rules that maintain the status quo. And to get to that point, we need to build grassroots support amongst regular people who can then elect the right decision makers and hold elected officials accountable. And we think it's our job to build that movement. Um, we have a really good start. Uh, Trey, was, Trey mentioned uh, about the city of Minneapolis' newly released draft transportation action plan. Uh, we think that this is a really visionary document and public works has done an excellent job uh, and it directly responds to uh, asks that we made while it was being written. Um, there's some really, uh, you know, visionary things, including specific mode share goals for the city by 2030, uh, the creation of a city-wide pedestrian priority network where walking will be prioritized, um, level of service is going to be removed as a metric for success, and the city's working on creating a new street design guide that will incorporate, you know, um, um, more progressive technical standards. Um, and so I just want to talk about, you know, our plans for 2020. And so while the Transportation Action Plan is a good start, there are still a large chunk of public streets that won't be affected by it. All the lines in green at, on this image here are actually streets that are owned by the uh, county, Hennepin County, that the city of Minneapolis lies within. And these streets are part of the high injury crash network that are identified in the city's Vision Zero Plan. And nearly one in two uh, streets on this network are not owned by the city. 42% uh, are operated by Hennepin County and 72%, 17% are operated by MINDA. Um, here's an example of what one of those streets might look like. West Broadway Street in Minneapolis, they are four lanes divided, often have high speeds, uh, high rates of pedestrian and bike crashes, and no, not really have any pedestrian and bike infrastructure. 
So if we need to achieve the goals laid in our vision for 2030, we also need to reshape these streets as well. So how are we planning to do that? Um, to build this movement, we are rolling out a campaign called County Streets for People, where we'll aim to build power and engage folks to live, work, and play along these uh, county-owned streets. We really want to harness our Open Streets events. Um, five of those events are actually on county-owned streets. Uh, we'll have our staff and volunteers handing out flyers, providing information, and encouraging folks to think about what these streets could look like if they were truly designed for people. Um, and our campaign will turn people out to community forums that will be located along those streets so folks can come, come there, talk about their transportation challenges, and collaboratively design a vision for the future. These are uh, pictures from forums that we had in December last year. And at the end of the year, we want to have what we're calling for now an accountability forum where folks who attended all these community forums uh, you know, come out and put forward their collective vision for redesigned streets uh, to elected officials and any public work staff who choose to attend. And we really think that now is the time to act, um, primarily because we have a, a really engaged and involved city council. Uh, we have some really good public work staff, both at the city and the county level. The Hennepin County staff have been really proactive in reaching out to us. Uh, the city's bike and pet coordinator, we feel it's a really good ally to us, and uh, the, the, the county's bike and pet coordinator as well. Uh, and we really think that building the community movement um, can get us to the next level to take really bold um, actions. And so I just want to end by uh, sharing, you know, what the city of Minneapolis looked like and how much it changed in just 60 years. These uh, two images of the same uh, section of downtown Minneapolis. Uh, you know, we were able to, you can see that in 1954, we had a pretty dense connected network of street grids. And in 2014, a lot of that has been given away to interstates and the movement and storage of cars. And so we think, you know, we can also do the opposite in, in a quick amount of time. Uh, we really think that it's possible to accelerate the work of building a city that truly puts people first. We just need to find the political will and, and public support for it, which is uh, the mission at Our Streets, Our Streets Minneapolis. And so you can keep up with our campaign at ourstreetsmpls.org and on our Twitter and our Instagram, uh, both at ourstreetsmpls.org. So I will turn it back to Emiko then, and i um, happy to take questions with the other presenters. Great. Thanks so much. Um, and actually, I'm going to turn it over to May for questions. Uh, she'll moderate those. As a reminder, please go ahead and put those in the chat box. I always see some really good questions coming in. Uh, so we will t I'll turn it over to you, now, May, who will moderate questions for all of us. Excellent. Um, like all the other speakers have mentioned, if you guys have trouble hearing me, please let me know, and I will try to adjust on my end. Uh, we have received a number of questions, really great questions for our speakers. Um, and I will move through as many as we can in the next 20 minutes. So if you have questions uh, now, please go ahead and submit those in the chat box, and we will keep an eye on it. So uh, the first question is for our Remix folks. Will Remix Street be incorporating a multimodal traffic simulation model to see the impacts and usages for the proposed concept design? Janice or Isaac, can you speak to that? Yeah, that's a really good question, and we get that a lot, actually. So in our street platform, when you have different concept scenarios that you've drafted up, Remix will actually show you um, people throughput at free flow capacity, though. So that's not quite modeling. Um, when it comes to modeling impact, it's um, very complicated. It's um, really unique per, per situation. But this past few months, I was actually part of a research and development team, and we tried to nail down um, very specifically the types of impact that city partners and transit partners care about. And so what we've learned from our research is that for transit agencies, bus speeds is one of the primary impacts that they would like to visualize. And then for um, our DOT partners, um, parking was um, top of the list. So moving forward, we're going to investigate further on those specific impacts. But when it comes to um, modal shifts, and that type of modeling, um, we're not quite there yet. Great. Thanks, Janice. 
Um, next question is for Trey. Um, question from a participant. It looked like there was some type of green new paint on the existing bike boulevard south side. What did that represent? Is that actually new ground striping? Any idea about that, Trey? No, I think that may be the boulevard that um, I, I tried my best to visualize and remix. Let me see if we go back to the text. Um, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure it was a boulevard. Great. Um, and Trey, maybe while you're looking for that, could you also speak a bit more about how you use Remix when engaging with the public about this particular topic? Project, yep. excuse me. Yep. Uh, so Remix was more so useful for internal and uh, coordinating with internal partners and divisional partners like our traffic and parking division and our engineering division, and also coordinating with the county. As I mentioned, um, this project had uh, a lot of overlapping um, other projects from, from the county and uh, other priorities, and so uh, more so we use Remix to coordinate with those divisions and show off, um, kind of brainstorm, you know, what can we actually do at the intersection. Uh, I think uh, one of my desires for Remix, and I've mentioned this to, to Janice and Isaac, is that you know we'd, we'd like to use it more for uh, engagement material, and I think uh, you know, Remix is making steps in that direction as well. Can I chime in, Trey? because we just yep. have a recent product update. Um, is it okay if I navigate to slide 17? Please. Okay. Yeah, okay. So in slide 17, which uh, I just put up here, this is a pretty recent. It mirrors the public outreach capabilities that our transit platform has. So essentially, you would be able to put your street, street sketches and remix and then send out a readme-only link to anyone who, even if they don't have a Remix account, and they would be able to input their name, optional, email, optional, and then a comment. Wonderful. Um, another question here, it looks like it's a question for Ash, but uh, if any of the other presenters have thoughts, please chime in. Um, in building community power, how much of that power and agency is given to high school students and college students to engage in projects and this work? Is there already a strategy for this? Um, I don't think we've done a lot of work specifically with that um, with that group of people. We have had we do often go out and pre and, and table at um, events that are presented by uh, at, at schools and at colleges. And I and I also always make it a point if you know if there's a professor who's teaching a class who wants a presentation from us, I always make it a point to accommodate that. Um, I think um, it, I, I think it's really important, especially for high school students and uh, college students, to really understand the connections between transportation decision making and all of the different things that go into making, you know, a livable community. And that's something that I'm hoping we can uh, talk about more. But uh, to, to a specific question, we really haven't done any work um, targeted at that community. Got it. Thank you. Um, question for our Remix folks. Is Remix available to do advocacy for advocacy organizations that are interested in proactively coming up with realistic and well-illustrated project proposals? I can, I can handle this one, Janet. So, so this, is, um, this is not something we, we've um, really gotten into that much in the past, just uh, haven't, haven't had much experience with that, but it, it'd be something that I think we'd be, be happy to discuss with you offline just to give a sense of, of your, your specific project. So I think our, our contact information is, is in, the, in the webinar, so, so feel free to reach out and we can, we can see what we can work out. Sounds good. Um, question for Ash: What were the what were the postcards that they delivered to City Council in Minneapolis? Can you talk a little bit more about that process? Sure. Um, so over the you know um, this was for our winter sidewalk maintenance campaign. Um, so we would have folks, um, volunteers, and people who were part of our, our uh, work groups who would go out with these specific postcards and ask people to to write on them why they believe that, that 
maintaining uh, sidewalks clear of snow and ice was important and talk about their personal stories uh, specifically, you know, how that would help them access opportunity, be able to get out of the home, or, you know, feel, uh, feel like walking was easy and comfortable in the city of Minneapolis. Write down those stories, and then we would take all of those postcards, add them to our system, and then stratify them by city council ward. And our volunteers would go and then deliver them to city council members who would then be able to see, you know, what sort of um, support they were getting from the community uh, on, um, you know, on, on winter sidewalk maintenance too. So I think we had about 3,000 postcards delivered to different um, city council members as a result of that campaign. Great, thank you, Ash. Um, I'm not sure who this is uh, directed towards, but all the speakers can jump in. Can you speak about the performance measure you plan to use in place of LOS? Maybe that's for Ash. Um, sure, I can uh, just briefly touch on that. I'm not the expert, and I'll let uh, Trey or others speak up. But um, you know, I think there's there's many different groups um, uh, doing some work on replacement measures for LOS. I think multimodal multimodal LOS is a really good start. But then within Smart Growth America, I know that the State Smart Transportation Initiative is working on accessibility measures along with City uh, Observatory uh, and the University of Minnesota. That kind of looks um, at, different way, uh, at, the, uh, at different ways that people can access uh, destinations and opportunities and gives different weights for, um, you know, if you're using uh, walking or biking instead of driving. And I think, uh, you know, for example, the state of California has moved to a VMT-based model where they look at reducing VMT overall instead of just looking at traffic delay at an intersection or on a segment of the roadway. So those are some starting points, but I think, again, I think a city should um, really look and see what works best for it, for its specific needs. Yeah, Nash, I can Try add on to add that. On oh, that. sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, first to jump up. in. Uh, uh, yeah, I can add. So uh, over at the Complete Streets Coalition, I just wanted to add uh, kind of a note that those of us at Smart Growth America with our different hats on as federal lobbyists have really been working uh, through the next update to the federal transportation bill, which was set to expire this year. Uh, to actually shift all states towards different, what we call, Ash mentioned, accessibility performance measures. Um, we'll include a link to some of the work that we've done on that, but it actually measures how well people, uh, both the people in cars versus people in transit, are able to access essential services, um, which are jobs, but also what, what I think is a term we're all becoming more and more familiar with. Uh, and then they overlay it with um, households living in poverty, uh, and it's a really interesting way to start to look at not just making a decision about one individual project and the level of service in that, but to think about the system you're trying to build, because as a reminder, uh, complete streets are not about just one great road, but uh, building a transportation system where users can, can get from their origin to their destination in that safe, reliable, affordable, equitable way. Uh, but it sounds like Trey wanted to add something as well. Yep, uh, thanks, Emco. Um, yeah, I would just add that the city of Minneapolis, um, uh, through our draft transportation action plan and some of our local planning and policy guidance, we're looking at prioritizing people uh, as opposed to looking strictly at uh, automobiles um, and other vehicular traffic. Great. Thank you both for that response. Um, next question uh, takes into consideration our current context of COVID-19. And it might be a good question for Ash. How would you suggest community outreach and engagement, um, especially in low income, and especially when reaching out to low income and people of color neighborhoods? Um, how, how do you suggest we do that now in the context of COVID-19? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And I wish I had a really good answer. That's something we're grappling with as well, uh, the crisis uh, kind of throws all of our community engagement plans a little bit into question. We're hoping that, you know, we can still begin to keep doing that towards, uh, you know, towards the end of the summer. Uh, but at, at this time, we are looking into, you know, all the things that we can do, uh, both from a digital perspective, but also uh, rely more heavily on things like phone banking, engagement on Twitter, uh, reaching out to folks who have pretty uh, big social media presences to see if we can get them 
to uh, to talk or tweet or, or or Instagram about you know some of the goals that we're trying to see. Um, but yeah, that's something that we are figuring out as as, as this crisis drags on. And um, you know, stay tuned on our website. You'll see uh, we'll, you you can see some of the things that we're doing in response to the to the crisis. Thanks, Ash. Um, a question for our Remix folks, a good clarifying question, and I would love to hear the answer to this. What is the source for the technical and engineering details that are used to prescribe the complete streets elements, such as how wide should a sidewalk be, or a bike lane, or a curb bump out, and what elements are essential in order to qualify as complete streets? Hi, uh, this is Isaac from Remix. So I just correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we, we take these from the, uh, the NACDO um, street design guidelines. Um, and then, so that, that's where we get kind of those, those default widths from, but then everything can be edited based on uh, local context. And sorry, would you mind re repeating the second part of the question? Sure. Um, what, what elements are essential in order to qualify as complete streets? Hmm. So I, I'm not sure if, if I can really answer this question, so I'm going to have to punt to, to someone else on the, on the call, because in my understanding, it, is it changes um, kind of uh, location by location. As so not, yeah, not a representative of the National Complete Streets Coalition, I would probably agree with that. But let's see what other um, speakers might have to say. Yeah, I think I would agree with that, especially within the context of the President's Bicycle Boulevard um, and using our complete, complete streets policy to guide our design. Um, if we were to prioritize all the modes that we should have, I mean, there would be trade-offs there that uh, wouldn't, would possibly create an unfeasible design. And so the, looking at a complete streets approach, um, we had to make a context-sensitive solution um, for a unique problem there. Great. Thank you. Um, another question for Ash. Could you talk about how or if you're working with organizations normally outside of the transportation universe, for example, housing, racial justice, environmental justice groups, to advance big policies and make change? We'd love to hear about that. Sure, yeah. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we realize that if we really do want to win, uh, we can only win with a coalition of many different organizations who have who for whom transportation might not be their primary focus um, a couple of examples uh, one of our close allies is uh, called the alliance for metropolitan St uh, stability uh, these are folks who uh, work on things for, for ranging from housing stability to making sure that um, transportation projects do not put pressure on uh, on communities of color for for displacement and gentrification uh, they've come out with a scorecard uh, that allows folks who uh, that allows new developments to kind of look at all the different um, consequences that their development might have and take proactive steps to mitigate that. Um, that's a really good example of uh, of a group that we work closely with, um, you know, and for whom transportation is not their primary focus. We also, um, you know, our streets Minneapolis has taken uh, a strong stance uh, on traffic enforcement as a solution. We don't believe that, um, that adding new police officers or, or cops to uh, enforce traffic laws is necessarily going to make our streets safer overall, and they, it will have a, uh, an impact on communities of color, uh, especially um, you know, with, with the things that have happened with police shootings and things. And so we work also with groups who uh, we, we instead ask for that money to be put into changing infrastructure instead uh, we work with groups who are who who, who talk about you know um, moving away from a more punitive uh, model of of enforcement, and they're they're some of our, our our good allies as well. Those are just a couple of examples, but uh, there are many uh, you know there are many different groups who neighborhood groups, uh, homelessness groups, all of which for whom transportation might not be the primary focus, but who uh, they're happy to kind of join us as we work on safer streets. Great. Thank you, Ash. Um, here's an interesting question for all the GIS folks out there. Uh, Ash, do you think there is any, and maybe Trey or maybe Remix folks, uh, do you think there's anything in particular that GIS folks can do to better support advocacy efforts in their own community?
I'm happy to uh, answer first. Yeah, sure. Well, yeah, I mean, um, I'm, uh, this, is, this is Trey. Uh, I'm a, a light GIS user. I uh, studied in school. But I think uh, with the city of Minneapolis, we have an open data policy, and there's a lot of data open to the public um, and people who are skilled enough in GIS, more skilled than I am, to manipulate the data and certain ways to uh, kind of reflect conditions or kind of highlight uh, uh, circumstances around the city that may um, you know, promote uh, or kind of uh, start any design decisions at certain, certain intersections or locations. So I mean, there's the data out there. Really, how creative you want to show it. I would add to um, that. Yeah, I this I've is seen a nice. lot of Sorry. Sorry, go ahead, Ash. Go ahead, Mikhail. Oh, this is Janice. Um, I would I would add to that. I've seen a lot of cities with really robust open data portals. Um, the quality of the open data portals sort of vary locality by locality, but. Um, one thing that's really important to have in an open data portal is updated metadata so that people who are using it understand the last time it was updated and um, sort of the caveats that the data comes with. Great. Uh, was there anyone else who wanted to say anything about this? Okay. Um, one more question and then I think we'll have to wrap up. Um, how did, and I'll open this up to all those speakers, but probably for Trey or Ash, how did the city of Minneapolis get Hennepin County on board to support the Vision Zero work being done in the city-maintained streets? Ash, do you want to take that one? Um, I, I don't know uh, necessarily uh, if I, I don't know the answer to that. I think that would have to come from the city of Minneapolis. But I think I do know from my conversations with both public works staff at the city of Minneapolis and at Hennepin County, they do work pretty closely together. Um, they consult with each other on, on all of the major projects. Uh, and, uh, you know, the city of Minneapolis and the county have contracts with each other to maintain or operate different parts of the infrastructure. Uh, I do think, however, that there is right now with the city's releasing of its new transportation action plan, there really is an opportunity for us to get uh, folks at Hennepin County as well to kind of seize that opportunity to get uh, their policies and their practices in line with what the city of Minneapolis is doing too. Um, because ultimately at the end of the day, these are still streets that you know, people of Minneapolis live and work and play on and um, you know, having different jurisdictions uh, behave differently in terms of how the streets are operated or maintained doesn't really work very well for, for um, you know, the folks who actually live alongside those streets. So I'm hoping that this is an opportunity for us to kind of come together and, you know, really uh, build a coherent vision that works well for everyone. Wonderful. Um, and I see that it's 2.30, but there is one question here that I think Ash can answer quickly, which is, People are interested in open streets. Where can they find more information? Do you have any ideas on where they could go to get more information about how to start their own? Yeah, um, that, that's a great question. We, uh, if you go to openstreetmpls.org, you can see um, our website that has, that has a lot of information on it. But um, you know, if you send me an email, we do have specific staff who, whose entire job is to put on the Open Streets program. They can take you through the entire process right from getting uh, a champion at city council to, um, you know, the permitting process as well as how do you, um, you know, run an event that has 100,000 people come in. We're happy to share that information. And if there's enough interest, we, we, we can even do uh, a webinar uh, uh, style um, outreach campaign. So, yes, yeah, send me an email. Wonderful. And I just put Ash's email up on the screen as well. Uh, and with that, this concludes the end of today's webinar. Thank you to everyone who was able to join us and to our speakers. We hope to have webinars like this in the future, so please do stay tuned and keep an eye out for our emails. Thank you, and have a good one, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.